In this third part of our lecture on atoms and molecules, we're going to move on and talk about the properties of water and how those properties make water such, such a uh, common compound found in so many things, both living and not on planet Earth. So there are a lot of different properties of water I'm going to be discussing, including the fact that it is highly polar, which we've already discussed. And I'm going to discuss very briefly about why that polarity makes it a good solvent. We're going to talk about things like cohesion and adhesion, which are two uh, properties of water that turn out to be very important for things like plants. Uh, we're also going to talk about its high heat capacity and surface tension and the fact that it's less dense than liquid water and why that's also important. So let's start out first here and talk about polarity one more time just to remind you. Remember that polarity means that if we have a water molecule that it has partial negative and partial positive regions that give it a partial charge. That charge is its polarity. Now um, when a molecule is able to be attracted to the partial negative and partial positive charges of water, we say it is hydrophilic. Hydro means referring to water and philic, oops, philic means that it is water loving, okay, water loving. Philic means to love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Hydrophilic means water loving. Now by comparison, if you have a molecule that itself doesn't have any partial positive or negative charges, then it's not going to be attracted at all to the partial positive and negative charges of water and therefore we would call it hydrophobic. Phobic means to uh, a fear, okay, like a phobia is a fear. So this is literally water fearing. A good example of this are um, fats. Hey, you know, if you put a greasy, uh, a greasy pan into a sink of water, the grease will float up to the top of the water. It doesn't dissolve in the water the way sugar would. Uh, it stays very separate because it's hydrophobic. So fats and oils are examples of hydrophobic molecules. Now then there's a third class of molecules that are called amphiphilic. Amphi means both, like an amphibian can exist both in land and water. Amphi means both. Philic again means love. That This is a molecule that it has part of it that's attracted to water and part of it that is not attracted to water. A good example of this is detergent. Okay, and this is an example of a detergent molecule you see here. It has a, what we call a polar head. This is an area that has partial positive and negative charges and I don't know if you can see it in this picture here but this oxygen atom right there has a negative charge so it's going to be very attracted to the partial positive charges of water so a polar head and this long nonpolar tail is a big old long fatty acid and as I said before fats are not attracted to water because they have no partial positive or negative charges in them and so while the the head of the detergent is attracted to water, the tail of the detergent is not. So this is an amphiphilic molecule, it contains both properties. Alright, next up let's talk about what makes water a good solvent. And, and the easiest thing to say about this, the easiest way to remember it is, anytime you've got these partial positive and negative charges in a liquid like water, it's going to be a good solvent because anything else that comes in contact with it that has partial positive and negative or even full positive and negative charges is going to be attracted to the opposite charges in the water. Now let me just back up here and, and make sure I define a couple terms for you that relate to uh, this word solvent. When you have a solution, okay, like say a sugar and water solution, there are always two components to it. There is the solvent, that's the liquid that does the dissolving like water. And then there is the solute. That is the item that is being dissolved into the water. So that's like the sugar that you dissolve in the water or the salt that you dissolve into the water. Now if we take an example down here of table salt, you can see that table salt, remember, is sodium chloride, that the sodium gives up one electron 
to the chloride, so sodium ends up being positive, chloride, um, and chlorine ends up being negative. These have positive and negative charges, and so therefore they are going to be very attracted to water molecules. And indeed, you can see down here on the sodium ion that the partially negatively charged regions of the oxygen in these water molecules are attracted and orient themselves towards that positive charge of the sodium. Whereas over here on the chlorine side, you can see the reverse is true. Chlorine has a negative charge, so it's a partially positively charged hydrogen portions of the water molecules that are oriented towards the chloride ion and are attracted to it. Now let's talk very, very briefly about these two terms, cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is the attraction that water has for other water molecules, and it's due to that hydrogen bonding we talked about, okay? So if I have, for example, a water molecule here, you remember we have these partial positive and partial negative charges, and if I have another water molecule over here with its partial positive, and partial negative charges, you will recall that, that we'll, we will get a hydrogen bond forming right here. It's not a true bond, but it's merely an attraction to between the partial positive hydrogen of one water molecule and the partial negative oxygen of another water molecule. That's cohesion. That is the uh, tendency for water molecules to stick together through hydrogen bonding. Now let's compare that with adhesion. Adhesion is the tendency of a water molecule to stick to some other molecule other than water due to these partial positive and negative charges. Okay, And uh, a good example of this is um, adhesion is what explains, adhesion and cohesion both, are what it explains how it is that water down in the root system of a tree can make it up to the leaves uh, to be used by those leaves. So the reason that it's able to move up into the tree has to do with the fact that the water molecules stick together and they also stick to the walls of the tubes that draw the water upward. Those, those um, tubes are called the xylem. Not that you need to know that, but the water gets drawn up as it sticks to those um, molecules to which it is attracted. Next up is high heat capacity. This is a really important thing to know. Now, first of all, I need to give you a definition of a term, the term calorie. Calorie is basically the amount of heat it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And basically, what we know about water is that because of all of those hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules, that as a result of that, I'll draw another one here for you, the end result of that is it takes an incredible amount of energy in the form of heat to get these uh, different bonds, these different water hydrogen bonds to break apart, okay? You may not know this, but all molecules are always vibrating all the time and they're bumping into each other, okay? And all these water molecules I've drawn down here are vibrating. If I heat them up enough, if I add enough heat to them, they vibrate even more and more rapidly. At some point, if I've added enough heat, they will be vibrating so quickly that the bonds, the hydrogen bonds between molecules will break apart and the water will then evaporate into the air, okay? Because I have to add so much heat to water molecules to get them to actually break, uh, break apart their hydrogen bonds with each other, that is what causes water to have such a high heat capacity. And you might say, well, who cares? Big deal. It has a high heat capacity. What, what does that matter? Well, it matters because what it means is you have to have water at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit before it will boil. That's a good thing to know because I wouldn't want to have water boil at, say, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That would mean every time I go outside to walk across campus, I run the potential of evaporating if it's the summertime and it's warm out. So the fact that water can absorb a lot of heat and still not boil is very useful for us as living organisms here on planet Earth. 
you can see here in this diagram that it takes a, a lot of energy, 540 calories to convert water from a liquid to a gas. To convert it from a solid to a liquid, from ice to water, uh, takes only 80 calories. Now if we didn't have those hydrogen bonds, this is interesting, if we didn't have these hydrogen bonds in here that we had to use extra energy to break apart, water would boil at minus 91 degrees Celsius and it would melt at minus 100 degrees Celsius. So those hydrogen bonds have a profound impact on the behavior of water and it explains why water is a common feature of all living organisms on planet Earth. Uh, I've got just a couple more slides to talk about before we're done with our topic of water and one is this idea of high surface tension. If you've ever been out on a lake or a pond or a creek or a stream, you might have seen these things called water striders. These are those little bugs that have the ability to literally walk on top of the water and you can see here how their feet literally cause dimples in the water they cause a dent in the water but they don't actually pierce through the water. This again has to do with the fact that we've got all these hydrogen bonds holding those water molecules uh, tight with each other. This is called high surface tension. Alright, last thing to talk about relating to water, another important characteristic for life on planet Earth is the fact that when water is in the um, uh, phase of being a solid, when it, when it is ice, it is less dense than when it is in the liquid form. Now that's the reverse of what we know is true for most things. In most cases of compounds and elements, the solid version is the most dense form. But this is not true with water. Ice is less dense with water and what that means is that if you put liquid water and ice together in the same container, the ice is lighter and it will float to the top. Which is really good if you've got a pond in the winter because the ice goes to the top and provides an insulative layer so that organisms can continue to live underneath the surface of the ice in the liquid uh, water. If it were the reverse, if ice were denser, the ice would sink to the bottom and then another layer of ice would sink to the bottom and another layer and another layer and pretty soon all of the water would be frozen and there would be uh, no place left for living organisms to go and they would die off in the winter. So another very important quality of water that's important for life on planet Earth. Last part of this lecture on, on molecules is uh, one where we're going to tackle the idea of acidity and um, alkaline behavior, which is pH, and I will see you there.